Praise the Lord, Antioch, and good morning to you. Wherever you are, wherever you have found yourself on this morning, we want to invite you into worship with us. So get up on your feet. Let's have a good time and lift up. Oh! 
us. We lift up your name, Lord. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Savior. We lift up our great and our mighty King. We praise your name, God, for all that you are, for all that you do, for all that you represent in our lives, Father God. For you are love, you are joy, you are peace. You are all the things that we'll ever need. And we're grateful for that, Lord. Grateful that you reign, Lord. We bless your name. shadow of death I will fear no evil for the Lord is my rod and my staff sing I walk I through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear The strong that's what I know him to be. He is a strong yeah, yeah, my God is a strong in time of need. He is a strong
Bless your name, Lord. Yeah, yeah. You are amazing. You took amazing grace. Amazing grace to save me. Broken and scattered In mercy gathered Mended and whole Empty-handed But not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free By your amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. I can see you. See the love in your eyes. Lay yourself down and raising up broken to Gathered, mended, and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free by amazing. How sweet that said. All these pieces broken and scattered. 
scatter in mercy gather mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free by amazing grace how sweet the rest oh I was was lost but, but now I'm found was blind but now I can see I can see I can see the love Raising up the broken We lift joy We lift joy We lift your name For your grace is amazing your love is amazing. You are amazing. Oh, there's a hymn that says this. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word oh, and just to rest upon his promise and just to others said you know it's a tear Broken and scattered In mercy gathered Minted and whole Empty-handed But not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Yes, I've been set free I've been set free I've been so free, yeah. I've been set free. No chains holding, cause I've been set free. 
no chains holding Cause I've been set free You're no longer bound Cause you've been set free You're no longer bound You've been set free By amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like Sing, oh Good morning, Antioch. It's time to give. If we were meeting in person, there'd be a rousing applause right now because we'd be a sanctuary of cheerful givers, right? But keep it real, we're in uncertain times. It can be uncomfortable to think about giving when finances are tight, our sources of income may be uncertain and our savings accounts may be dwindling, but our source is God. Our source is not our jobs and not our bank accounts. The Bible says, look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor store away in barns, yet God feeds them. And God loves us more than he loves birds, right? So let's give as though that is the absolute truth. You can text to give, you can give through the Antioch LB app, and you can also mail in your gift. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give, even in uncertain times. We thank you that you continue to provide for us and meet our needs. You make sure that we are taken care of because you love us. We pray that our gifts are blessed to multiply, that you would increase us and increase our church home um, with these gifts. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you know you got joy down in your soul, you can sing this with us. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, know you've captured me. I've got joy instead of more to say there's beauty in my I've got true love instead of There's freedom though you captured I've got joy We can sing this together Cause you give me joy down, down, deep in my soul. down, down, deep in my soul. that feels good. Yeah, you give me joy. Down, deep in my soul. Back to the top. Say there's a beauty in my soul. I've got true love. There's freedom, though you captured me. I've got joy instead of Let's take it out together. You give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Lord, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep. Let's take it out. 
Never been so free Caught in your love for me Never felt more secure Knowing your heart Lord. Never been Never been more secure Sing that again Say never been so free Caught in your love for me So free, so Got true love instead of pain. Their freedom, oh, you've captured me. I've got joy instead of more. Everybody sing. There's a beauty in. I've got true love. And there's freedom, oh, you've captured Together, let's say it. Cause you give me joy. Hey, Antioch family, it's so good to be with you again for another worship experience. God has a word for you, a word in season to all of our guests and friends. We're grateful that you've tuned in. You could have literally been anywhere, but you decided to worship with us. And I'm telling you, you are in the right place at the right time. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful, so thankful for this time that you've given us to share together. Open up our eyes. Give us in-depth insight, wisdom, and revelation that we'll know how to proceed. May we stay in step with you as we journey into unknown territory well. And we'll give you glory for it. We'll give you honor. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you weren't here last week, I challenge you to go back and listen to the message from last week entitled, How to Journey Well into Unknown Territory. We find Joshua and the children of Israel at the verge of crossing over into the promised land. They've been wandering in the wilderness for some time. They've camped out for three days. God gives them instruction as they are on the verge of going into a new place. And it picks up at the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Listen to these words. It says, then Joshua rose early in the morning. And he and all of the sons of Israel set out from Shittim to the Jordan, 
And they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there should be between you a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near to it that you will know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. How to journey into unknown territory. I know it may seem unrelated, but timing, timing is so important. It is important across the board. It is, it is a universally held truth that timing is so important. Whether you've had dance partners uh, that were seamless in their entanglement with you on the dance floor or whether that experience was a complete nightmare depended on their, their timing. When you moved, if they didn't move the right way, it could be painful. I don't know if you've ever been there where you're on the dance floor and looking for your way out. Not only in dancing, in your car's engine, as it relates to the mechanics of your car's engine. And listen, I am no mechanic, but I do understand that there's something to timing combustion happening in your engine when the spark plugs fire and causes that combustion and everything begins to move. If the timing is off, your car will stutter. It will delay. It won't respond when you give it gas. Sometimes it won't even turn over. If the timing is off, your car doesn't run properly or can't run at all. This is true of dancing. It's true of the vehicle that you drive. It's true of racing. As I shared last week when I ran track, often one time around the 400 meters, everyone looked the same until we got to the end of the curb and the coach would yell out, now it was a timing issue. I was able to accelerate. When everyone else died out at the end, I was coached well. Coach taught me timing. This is true of dance. It's true of your car. It's true of athletics. But it's also true as it relates to relationships. Sometimes you can be connected to the right person at the wrong time. And as opposed to the two individuals complimenting one another, they actually are combustible. Timing is so important. Timing is everything. There is often with God a timing issue that trips people up when journeying into new territory or when journeying into unknown territory. Timing can mess you up. We talked last week a bit about the awkwardness of when God decides he wants to move. The children of Israel were on the verge of moving into a new place. God decides to have them get up and go after the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God or the movement of God. After laying out for three days, they fasted the last day or consecrated the last day, and the Ark of the Covenant was carried by the priest, which represents, once again, the presence of God moving. God says, now is the perfect time to cross. But he had them cross when the Jordan River was overflowing at all of its banks, which was literally the worst time anyone could have crossed. Not only did he have them cross at that time, it could have been five months before, five months after. He waits until, according to all observable reconnaissance, the wrong time. He has them move at that time when the Jordan is overflowing at all of his banks, but also in a place where there was 
difficulty in navigating the space with wild animals filling the area. Worked through that last week in how God chooses often to move when we would conclude it's the wrong time. God says it's divine time. But that's not the timing I'm talking about today. Not God moving in inopportune times or while we're experiencing challenging circumstance, but I'm speaking of the pace at which we progress. If we don't pace things the right way, then we often forfeit significant opportunities. Even bearing fruit or producing good things is a timing issue. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalms 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, I know we focus on that, but listen to what it says next. It says, which yields fruit in its season. And its leaves does not wither. Whatever he does, the Bible says, prospers. But notice that line. It says that he yields fruit in season. In other words, he produces at the right time. There are certain times where fruit is produced in the wrong season. There are other times where fruit should be produced. And there's nothing there. The tree is barren. There are no results when there should be results. Or there are results at the wrong time. There are times where we receive things in our life we would call blessings. But because we don't have the character to sustain them, the blessing actually becomes a curse. Timing speaks of the right thing at the right time. Not being ahead or behind, because being ahead or behind can be devastating. Now notice, there is a rhythm and movement implied in this text. God says, I need you guys, we're getting ready to go into some unknown territory, and I'm getting ready to bless you, but he says, I need you folks to get your timing together. If you can, just type right there. Type in, if you can, Timing, timing, timing is so important. Timing is everything. Now, you're wondering if I'm in the text, and here it is. Tail end of verse number three, getting into verse number four. Listen to what he says. He says, when the ark moves, when you see the ark move, here we are. He says, I need you to get up and go after it. In other words, you've been camped out. I've allowed you to lick your wounds. I've allowed you to rest after 40 years, you and your parents, 40 years of walking in the wilderness. It is a wearying and fatiguing journey, and I've had you sidelined, sidelined without any movement from me, sidelined without any clear revelation about what's next, sidelined. You've, you've ceased movement for a while, and sometimes that's necessary, but God says, I'm getting ready to move people from being sidelined. You've, you've had enough time to rest. You've had enough time to lament. We're going somewhere now. He, they said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant move, I need you to go after it. However, notice how he says you're to follow the Ark of the Covenant. There shall be between you a distance of 2,000 cubits by measure. Here's what he says. Do not come near it that you will know which way you shall go. Why? Because you've never passed this way again. God says, listen, I need some room because I'm getting ready to take you into unknown territory, territory that you are unfamiliar with. Whenever I take you into a territory that you're unfamiliar with, please understand you cannot approach it in the same way that you've approached every other endeavor. You can't approach it the same way that you've approached every other opportunity. We're going to have to walk differently. When God takes you into new territory, you have to change your pace. You have to walk differently. Here's what God says. He says, when I move, when the priests move the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, he says, when I move, you move. 
When I stop, you stop. When I progress, you progress. Keep your eyes on me. Let your movement be determined by your sensitivity to my movement. Let me say that again. Let your movement be guided by your sensitivity to my movement. In other words, let your activity emerge out of your intimacy. In terms of intimacy, there is proximity. But directionally, he says, I need some distance. I need you to create some room. I, I'm connected with you in terms of your relationship with me and your heart's position and your sensitivity to my spirit. But as it relates to where we're going, we're going into unknown territory. And while I need your heart connected to me, I need you to give me some room, realizing that there is a chasm in between my understanding in your understanding. There is a chasm fixed between my ability to see what is ahead and your ability to see what is ahead. So he says, as you go into unknown territory, point number one, God says, I need you to give me some room. Yeah, you hear it? He says, give me some room. I, I know what you think. I know based on empirical data, the conclusions you've come to and assumed what I can do and what I cannot do, what will happen in your future and what may not happen, how things will never be the same. They may never be the same, but here's what God says. I need you to give me some room. He says, I need you to fix a chasm between the ark and the people of about 1,000 meters or 1,000 yards. I can't remember which one it is, but I know the Bible says 200 or 2,000 cubits. He said, I need some room between you and me. What was he showing us here? He says, listen, folks, I, I know you're nervous about going into territory that you've never been in before. He said, but don't crowd the ark. Somebody's word right there. Stop crowding the ark. Could you imagine if there was not room between them and the ark of the covenant, if everyone rallied around the ark, got so close to the ark, the people behind them couldn't see. He said, I need to go up 2,000 cubits ahead of you so that everyone is able to see the movement of the ark. There is a distance in between. There needs to be a distance in between where I am and where you are. Not only is this true of that short span of geography, but this is true philosophically. It is true theologically. God's thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. And we get into trouble when we assume that we see as much as God, that we know as much as God. We get into trouble when we begin to take things into our own hands as opposed to realizing God is beyond us. While God is near us intimately, directionally, there is a dimension of him that is beyond us. I'm making up words. It's the beyondness of God. And here's what I found. As a believer, I've got to be comfortable with the beyondness of God. God says, don't crowd me right now because we're going to new territory and you need to be able to see. How do we crowd the ark? We crowd the ark with our anxiety concerning outcomes. Let me say that again. We crowd the ark with our anxiety concerning outcomes. God, how's it going to happen? God, when is it going to happen? God, where is it going to come from? God, is it going to be okay? God says, wait a minute, give me some room. Give me some room to function. Give me some room to operate while I'll never leave you or forsake you. There's intimacy and relationship. I need you to give me room to operate. Not that it's 
that God needs the room, but it's God understands we need the room because you can't follow his movement and also be preoccupied with anxiety at the same time because timing, here we go again, anxiety throws off your pace. Anxiety throws off your steps. You end up entertaining what may come as opposed to keeping your eyes lifted to the ark entertaining the movement of the Spirit in this very moment. We crowd the ark when we become filled with anxiety about outcomes, when we allow God to initiate the journey. What's crowding the ark? It's when we allow God to initiate the journey, but decide that we'll control the process. People get into trouble when they allow God to initiate the journey, but determine that they will control the process. Abraham and Sarah allowed God to speak the word that he would be the father of many nations, initiated the process, but decided that they would take control of the outcomes in the process and created an Ishmael. By trying to help God out, they allowed God to initiate the process or the journey, but they said, I'll take it from here, God. Not only did this happen with Abraham and Sarah, but we find Saul when God's answer does not come to him soon enough. There is no prophetic word from heaven as opposed to waiting for God to speak patiently. He said, God's not moving fast enough. Timing issue. What did he go do? He went to find the witch at Endor. To give him the information that he needed. He found a medium to try to call on a dead prophet to give him revelation concerning what was next. As opposed to waiting on the Lord, seeking the face of the Lord. He said, God's taking too long. Let me find a witch. I don't have time to unpack that, but some of you are looking for revelation in all the wrong places. Sometimes for your own safety and for your own development, God will delay answers. That is part of journeying with him. And some of you in this day and age are still going to alternative spiritual sources looking for answers that God has not given you yet. But be very careful to not get ahead of God. The Bible says that Joshua's predecessor, Moses, was doing good, journeying well. But why isn't Moses walking in the promised land with him? He got ahead of God. He allowed God to initiate the promise by taking him out of his position in Pharaoh's house and using him as deliverer. God met him when he was nobody on the backside of the wilderness and turned him into a great deliverer with signs, miracles, and wonders following. God walked with him and God talked with him and God backed his moves. But he got to the end of his journey. God told him to speak to the rock and water would come out. The first time he told him, strike the rock and water would come out. The second time he told him, speak to the rock and water would come out. But Moses reached in his bag of tricks as opposed to trusting the God that did the miracles and decided that he would strike the rock again. Water came out, but he missed his promised land. He allowed God to initiate the promise, but he decided that he would complete the process. Be very careful when you take back direction of your own life. You take back direction of your own way, your own existence. Be very careful when you allow God to begin the process, but now you're going to manage all of the outcomes because it will get you out of the timing of God. Give him room to function. Give him room to operate. Give him room to move. Stop crowding the ark with your own ideas, with your own opinions, with your own directions, with your own anxieties, with your own fears. God says, give me room. 
There's nothing you could add to this for me because you've never gone this way before. Please understand, I've gone ahead of you, not only physically, I've gone ahead of you in terms of revelation insight. I'm as familiar with your tomorrow as you are with your yesterday. In fact, I'm more familiar with your tomorrow than you are with your yesterday. I live, I am not bound by space and time. So when I tell you to move, I've already secured the outcome before before you've ever taken a step. There's nothing you can add to this process. I know what's ahead. Flip side is, you have no clue as it relates to what's ahead. So what I'm going to need you to do, boo-boo, is back up just for a minute, give me some room, and follow my movement. You will get results but never get to your ultimate destination if you're not sensitive to timing. We're used to drawing near in intimacy, but directionally, he says, I need you to get back far back enough to realize that there's a distance in between you and I. And this new place, you will never enter without reverence for my direction, my way. Oh, you're not going to get into this successfully or through here successfully in independence. But there is interdependence. You're going to have to follow me into this place. This is where if you decide to do it your way, Success will be thwarted. If you decide to do it your way, your activity will be frustrated. If you decide to do it your way up in here, you're going to make a mess of destiny, a mess of purpose. He accomplishes this by not letting success come by taking things into our own hands and doing it our way at our pace. God says, I'm intentionally creating a gap so that you remember my ways are above your ways. I'm intentionally creating a gap by reminding you will not enter into this place at your own pace, but it must be on my terms. Read my lips. On my terms. Someone's tempted at this moment to get out of alignment with God because God, as the priests are carrying the ark, God is moving too slow. Can I tell you what the enemy will always do here? When you feel as if God is moving too slow, He'll play on your vulnerability in those moments to try to get you out of step. He'll try to get you out of purpose. He'll try to get you to short circuit your destiny by coming out of your pace. In these moments in our life, pace is everything. Can't you hear the timing of Jesus? He is only paced by the movement of the ark, only paced by the movement of his father in heaven. When they asked him, what is the engine that drives your behavioral patterns? He says, I only do what I see my father do in heaven. Only what I get a revelation of God desiring is what I do. That is what fuels my activity. That's what fuels my movement. That's what fuels my direction. I only do what I see. He says, keep your eye on the ark. He says, when it moves, you move. When it stops, you stop. Don't get ahead of it. Don't trail behind it. But allow the rhythm of your movement to be determined by the movement movement of God. Jesus says he's in the wilderness tempted by the devil. The enemy comes in in an attempt to get him out of the will of God and to get him to violate his purpose. The second temptation the enemy gives him, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, listen, if you just, watch the timing, if you bow down to me right now, right here, Real quick, nobody will even see. It's just the two of us out here. 
He says, if you will bow down to me right here, real quick, small, subtle compromise, because the enemy will always come in moments of vulnerability to try to get you out of the pace of God. He says, bow down to me real quick right here, get up, and here's what I'll do. I will give you all of the kingdoms of this world. As far as your eye can see, Jesus looks back and says, worship the Lord, your God alone. I'm not bowing down to you. I worship my father alone. Now, here's the timing issue. What Jesus knew is that he was going to receive the kingdoms of the world anyway. But the route that God was taking Jesus into was through Gethsemane to the cross, to the grave, to resurrection before it was declared that all power, all authority of heaven and earth is in my hand. Listen, Jesus said, I'm going to get it anyway. But what you're trying to do is get me out of the timing of God. Get me out of the movement of God. Get me out of the rhythm of God by promising something before it's time. God, I feel like preaching this. He says, you're trying to promise what God has for me anyway before God has it for me. And what the enemy will do when there is a need in your life or when there's anxiety or God does not seem to be moving fast enough is he will always give give you a shortcut promising what God ultimately has for you. But here's the challenge. If you compromise, you may receive some benefit. But when you're out of God's timing, you fall short of what he ultimately has destined. He says, give me some room. I know it's taking time. I know you can't see your way. But don't look at your circumstance. Don't look at this river that is overflowing. Don't look at the wild beasts that are surrounding you. He said, but keep your eyes in this season on me. It's most difficult because in this season or through these seasons of challenge is where anxiety sets in. It's where fear sets in. It's where uncertainty sets in. And the temptation when that happens is to bring things onto my terms so that I can control them. I'm the master of my destiny. God said, not through here. He says, give me some room. Don't crowd the ark. I need somebody to type in real quick timing. Type in timing. If you determine that you're going to stay in God's timing, that you're not going to be pulled. You may be anxious. You may be fearful, but you're going to stay in step with God. You're going to watch your pace. You're going to keep timing with the Spirit of God. Not only should you not crowd the ark, But you don't need to get ahead of it or behind it either. Listen to me. Pressure will often cause you to get ahead of God. Sometimes pressure, doubts, and fears will cause you to to lag behind the pace of the Lord. God says, move, and you say, I'm unqualified. He didn't ask you that. He just said, move. God says, speak, and you say, no, I'm not as good as everybody else. God says, I didn't ask you that because I'm going to cause my blessing to rest on what you give me. But, But many of us trail behind the ark. God is moving and often dragging us into our destiny as we've dug our heels into the ground. Be very careful in this season not to drag behind God. He's going to give revelation and your answer is yes. He's going to give direction and your answer is yes. He's going to give inventive ideas and concepts. Listen to me. And your answer is to be yes because in this season when you discern the ark moving, you have to move with it. You cannot drag behind the ark. Nor can you get ahead of the ark. Yeah, I, I know what it is to get ahead of the ark. 
not only take my destiny into my own hands, but once I know what God wants or where God said he would take me, sometimes I have the tendency to get ahead of God in my pursuit to the Jordan River. Oh, this is where we're going to cross? The priests are moving too slow. Let me get there first. Yeah, I know what it is to trail behind, but I also know what it is to get ahead of the plans of God, to get ahead of the movement of God. One of the first signs that you're getting ahead of God, God promised you that you would have resource, but you're going to run to try to double down on the first opportunity that comes. You can get ahead of the ark. By putting resources into what God has ordained. Listen to me. The first sign that you're a little bit ahead of God is you start to lose the peace of the Lord. You start to lose the peace of the Holy Spirit. You start to move into striving or activity that is not ordained. And it no no longer feels blessed. You lose the peace of the Lord. Everybody looks on the surface and says, you're making moves. You're grinding. You're hustling. But internally, you know. And it's not your work ethic that's driving you. It's your fear that's driving you. It is your insecurity in unknown territory that's driving you. It is your desire to reclaim control in a place that is unfamiliar that is driving you. And God says, don't get ahead of me. Yes, it's tough not to get ahead of God. But this year, I said yes to some things I should have said no to. Anybody ever been there? Speaking when I should have recommended someone else to step out, getting ahead of God. When you get ahead of God, You don't have the luxury of seeing the wonders. But when you stay in step with God, giving proper room for him to operate, you get not only to witness the wonder, but you get to walk through the wonder. You get to see him part the river Jordan, but you get to walk over on dry ground as well. When you get ahead of God, what's funny is you have to end up waiting on God anyway. Because you imagine if, if someone broke the camp and ran out in front of the Ark of the Covenant to get to the edge of the River Jordan because God was moving too slow. He didn't answer fast enough. The pace wasn't at the cadence that they expected. Could you imagine if they ran ahead of God like so many of us have done in our lives only to find for our happiness to be restored, for our peace to be restored, for things to work and for us to see the miraculous. We have to wait on God anyway. So if I'm going to have to wait on God anyway, I may as well follow his instructions. I may as well pace myself, not according to everyone else's standard of progress, but I must pace myself with the Lord. Because I can doesn't always mean I I should. For somebody, in this season, you need the courage to disappoint others. Because while God says there's a distance directionally between you and I as we go into this new place, here's what happens. Could you imagine a few million people gathered together Shoulder to shoulder. While God was up ahead, making a way, they were in proximity to one another. And here's what happens when you journey into new territory. Not only is there insecurity concerning what's next for you, but there is often a group dynamic experience because you're shoulder to shoulder with other people that have their own fears, with other people that have their own opinions, with other people that have their own phobias, with other people that have their own anxieties. You're shoulder to shoulder, and if not careful, even though you decide to walk at God's pace, you will often get pushed at the pace of others. Yeah, get pushed 
at the pace of others, pushed into things at the pace of others. But in this season, you have to ensure that you're being led by the movement of the Spirit and not by the universal felt sense of the crowd. Because often the people at your periphery and in your rear can nudge you out of the timing of God. This is the time where you need to have the courage to disappoint others by undoing some things that you stepped into because you said yes, but God said no. It's okay, listen to me. To get back into alignment, to get back into your sense of purpose, to get back into your place, listen to me. You rather disappoint them than get out of rhythm and get out of alignment because when you're out of timing, when you're out of alignment, when you're out of your rhythm, you also run the risk of short-circuiting your destiny. I'm sorry, but I've got to get back into alignment. You're cute, but not my promise. I've got to get back into alignment. You, you pay well, but this job is vexing my spirit. I've got to get back into alignment. It's a good cause, but not my call. I've got to get back into alignment. You're killing the game, but, but we're not compatible. I've got to get back into alignment, entertaining, but robbing my intimacy with God. And I've got to get back into my rhythm because I'm walking into an impossible situation and I need the Lord to do a miracle for me to cross over into new territory. And excuse me, you haven't been this way either. You are not the expert, but I'm listening to the Lord. Sometimes you get pushed from behind by the nervousness and the anxiety of others. Sometimes you're pushed because people around you feel irrelevant because things are not moving the way they expect them to move. So they push ahead of God to try to create activity when they feel God's moving too slowly. You try to create movement before God says now is the time you get pushed. But you have to learn how to let them go around you. Uh, can I just say this? In this season, some of you are going to have to learn as you're being prodded and poked and pushed from behind. Some of you are going to have to learn to just step aside and say, listen, you go ahead. I'm, I'll let you go ahead if you decide to, but I can't get away ahead of God. As for me in my house, we're going to stay in integrity. As for me in my house, we're not going to hustle through this, but as for divine blessing. As for me in my house, I know it hasn't come yet, but I have a promise of God. And I'm not going to get out of timing. I'm not going to get out of alignment. I'm not going to change my cadence. As I see God move, I move because I've come too far to mess things up now. I'm not circling this the way I circled the wilderness. We learned our lesson being stuck in a circumstance we should have gotten through in 11 years for 40 years. I'm not doing that now. I'm in maturity. And when you're mature, you don't get ahead of God or don't trail behind God, but you move in pace. You move in step with God. And if you're going to move in step with God, sometimes you have to step aside and let people who are pushing you go ahead. I dare you to look at somebody sitting next to you and tell them, I'm going to stay in step. Yeah, it costs me too much. I'm going to stay in step. I've been in this journey too long. I'm going to stay in step. I'm going to let whoever needs to go around, go around. If I'm too slow for you, go around. If it's not happening as fast as you would like it, go around. I've, for too many years of my life, been pushed and directed by everybody. But now is the season because there's too much on the line where I've got to stay in step with God. Yeah, get your timing back. Get your timing back. When you committed to staying in step with God, the enemy will always ensure that there is someone to tell you that you're behind. And you're going to miss it. If you don't do what everyone else is doing, you're going to miss it. If you don't jump ahead, you're going you're gonna to miss it. 
And it'll often play on your internal psyche that you are behind. It produces a striving rather than a belief that it's going to be God that has to do this. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but God sent me to declare, no, you're not behind, but you are in step. You're not behind, but you're in step. Don't allow anyone, even your own security, to push you out of God's pace so that you begin to compromise and short circuit your destiny. You are not behind, but you are right on time. God, I feel that. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I can declare to somebody, you are right on time. I, I, I know people are posting things all over Instagram and you're feeling as if you're trailing behind but you are right on time don't be moved to the, look to the left or don't be moved to look to the right keep your eyes on the ark looking to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of your faith my eye is on the Lord because if it's God and I'm in step with him the river God, I feel this. It's not going to close up until I get there. I don't care how long they have to hold it. But because I'm in obedience, I have the assurance of knowing I can take my time walking with God, trusting God, faithfully communing with God, because that doggone river is not going to close until I get through it. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I declare to someone, you can take your time and walk with God. Let them laugh at you. Let them make fun of you. Let them appear like they're getting ahead. I declare Declare to you, you are in step and the river will not close until you walk through it. The door will not shut until you get through it. The blessing will not stop falling until you get to where God's called you to be. When you're in step with him, God will command the blessing in the place that he's called you to walk in. If you believe it, say amen. Hallelujah. 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 I'm right on time. I'm right in the spirit. I'm walking with you, God. I'm not keep taking my eyes off of you. I've never been this way before. And when I've never been this way before, my eyes can deceive me. My perception can deceive me. My past files can deceive me. My friends can lead me astray because while they're trying to act like experts, they haven't been here either. So the best thing we can do is hold one another down and say what does God have to say about this what is God doing what is the ark doing if the ark is moving we're moving we're not getting ahead of God or behind God because he's commanded the blessing at the place that he's called us to walk through they pace themselves at the timing of God we're already in impossible territory. My job is not to hustle my way through, but to obey my way into my blessing. You go ahead. Go, go ahead. I, if I need to step aside, I don't think you should, but you, you go ahead. I, I don't want to slow you down. Let me, let me you, 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 go, you go around, but I'm at the pace of God. I, I, I'm not worried about you. If you decide to do it, go, go, go ahead. I'm at the pace of God. I, I'm not worried about who's first. I'm at the pace of God. Here's what I know. We're all in step with God. He's going to hold that river until every single one of us gets through. I'm at the pace of God. And, I, and I'm not concerned again with who's first. I'm not concerned with whether you get through there or not. There's not a prize for who gets through first. There's not a prize for how dramatically you get through. There's just a prize for everyone who got through. And when you're mature, you're not looking to do it first. When you're mature, you say, I just want to make it over. The reason I want to make it over, like the old folks used to say, is so I can tell my story. I, I'm going to have a testimony to tell. I don't want to go through and not be in step with God. I don't want to progress in disobedience. I want to tell my story. I'm going to tell my testimony. I'm going to tell how people, again, were at their own pace, but I stayed with the Lord and he brought me into territories. He brought me into blessing. He brought me into areas I did 
didn't think were possible. I'm going to have a story to tell. I'm going to tell the story of how I sat back in obedience and God worked wonders before my very eyes. I'm going to have a story to tell. Not only for those that are around me. We're going to celebrate when we get to the other side of this. But for generations who follow me, they will see what obedience to the Lord will do. When you keep your timing, when you keep your pace, I'm done. But as I close, I want to remind you that your perspective in unknown territory will pull you out. Yeah. Your perspective in unknown territory, never gone this way before, will pull you out. When you're in unknown territory, often you have to set your perspective beyond where you are and fix it squarely on the promise of God. The Bible says even as Jesus went into unknown territory, oh, you didn't think God of all the universe could go into unknown territory? Yes, he never felt what it was to, to feel sin. But when he took the weight of your sin and my sin upon himself, Jesus for the first time went into unknown territory. But how did he get through it? The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It wasn't just a physical pain, but it was a spiritual agony. He was able to get through a place that he had never experienced by setting his sights on what was beyond the circumstance. Can I tell you? Your perspective is the internal anchor that allows you to keep your pace. There could be two men or two women for that matter, two individuals who are both in the same financial state. They could both be broke. But if one knows that in five years they'll receive $20 million as an inheritance in their account while they are literally in the same, God, I feel this, circumstance. They don't walk through the circumstance the same way. They don't buy spam and crackers the same way. One says, I'm tired of eating this. The other one says, it's a matter of time before this becomes filet mignon. They, they don't check out the same way as one is embarrassed that they have to use assistance to purchase their groceries. The other one says it's a matter of time before I'm going to own this store in the same circumstance, but their perspective is different based on one having a promise. They sit on the same bus stops and use the same three transfers to get to where it would take them 45 minutes in a car to get to, and one cusses every step of the way as they ride on the bus while the other one is celebrating, looking out the window, car shopping, trying to determine what they're going to drive this time in five years. And all I'm here to declare is, Antioch, we have a promise. I know we're in the same circumstance as everyone else. I know that it looks dire for many, but I came to declare that your perspective will help you keep your pace. I don't have to get ahead of God. I don't have to get behind God. I can keep my pace, my soul is anchored by a promise from the Lord and that is when I get to the Jordan's edge, he's going to do wonders and he's going to keep it open and not let it close until I walk through it. I know I'm walking in a time of flood. I know I'm walking in unknown territory and treacherous marsh. I know there are wild animals out there. I know that the economy is uncertain. I know the socio-political environment is crazy. I know that this has been the most trying year of your life, but I challenge you to keep your eye on God. Listen to me. You are not getting through this like everybody else. You're walking through this unknown territory with a 
promise that if you keep pace with the Lord, he is not going to bring you out. He's going to bring you through in dramatic fashion. And he's going to do what you've never seen him do before. How do you journey into unknown territory well? You're keeping pace. You keep timing with the Lord. Father, we're so grateful. We're so thankful for this time that you've given us to share together. Now we pray. You don't allow us to be moved to the left or the right, to not be prodded or pushed beyond your pace. That our own fears, doubts, insecurities, insecurities don't calls us to trail behind your movement. Lord, if we walk with you, trusting you for the outcome as the one who began the great work, as we trust you to complete it, we can enjoy the journey. And so I pray right now, Lord, that you bring enjoyment back. I pray that you bring peace back. I pray that you replace cussing with rejoicing even before we get to our place of promise. As good enough is done because of the one who has promised. And now, Lord, until then, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise and declare that we will stay in pace and in step with you. The name that is above every name, the name of Jesus the Christ, all those who agree that God will do it, I need you to say amen. Type amen if you believe that he'll do it.